see how it works here. Seven a.m. The day begins, just like yesterday, just like tomorrow. What'll it be like by mid-morning, by mid-afternoon, by midnight tonight? You never know. Neither do we. Not at seven a.m. But as the Twin Cities awake and start another day, they'll start making news. We'll be there so that you may be there and witness for yourself the sight and the sound of the news as it happens. Car 2 calling KAG 723. Car 2. This is KAG 723. Go ahead, Car 2. Car 2 Church, cruising Minneapolis. 10 4, Car 2. Car 1, are you on service? 10 4, Dave. Cruising St. Paul, just passing the state capitol. 10 4, KAG 723, off at 7.05 a.m. Dave. Yes, Dave. We've got two cars out, churches in Minneapolis, show home in St. Paul. Do you have anything set up for them? Not at the moment. See what you can find on the overnight tapes. Will do. Well-balanced coverage of news for television doesn't just suddenly appear on the home television screen as if by magic. It's the product of hours of hard work by adept newsmen, equipped with a host of electronic tools and experienced at using those tools to best advantage. This is the communications room for WCCO-TV News, the nerve center for its coverage of spot news, those sudden, unpredictable events which make for spectacular newsreel footage. The men who staff this room are promising television journalism students, getting to know the news business through a cooperative training program established with the University of Minnesota and other colleges in the area. They learn to master a complex system, which was designed by WCCO-TV engineers to record emergency police messages from two cities, two counties, and the highway patrol. Impulse keyed to record, the tapes provide a rapid-fire method of checking back for details on a particular call, eliminating the possibility that a misunderstanding on the first call will delay the cameraman's arrival at the scene. He has to be there as it happens. A system like this will get him there. After that, it's up to him. Covering spot news is like that. It burns up gasoline, nerves, and film. But only occasionally does it provide the dominating story of the day. WCCO TV news editors, attempting to fulfill a total obligation of public service and responsibility, rely on radio-equipped cruisers and an alert communication center to provide them with newsreel coverage in the immediate Twin Cities area and on a fast airplane linked by two-way radio with that same communication center to get their reporters and cameramen to the scene of fast-breaking stories anywhere in a five-state area. Well, how's it look? Way up there. City Council has a public hearing on the transfer of the liquor license. And we've got a piece working on classes for gifted kids in the Minneapolis public schools. And I thought we could make something out of opening day at the ballpark. Why don't we start our Skid Row series today? We've got everything, all the pictures shot, everything shot except the soundtrack. We could shoot that. It wouldn't take too long. Okay, I'll put uh, Sullivan on that with you. How about an animation story for tonight on the uh, on the St. Paul freeway controversy? It's a pretty good yarn over there. Yes, it is. Uh, about all I can do is put Dwayne and Holly on it and see what we come up with. That's enough for a starter, anyway. Maybe we'll pick up a couple along the way. 10 a.m., 12 hours from the next edition of the 10 o'clock news, WCCO Television's major daily newscast. Nearly one million Minnesotans will have that newscast tuned in viewing the day's output of a working staff of 25 cameramen, reporters, editors, and lab technicians. 
they will see news recorded as it happens with the latest motion picture and sound recording equipment available. Some of it, like this portable light unit, for example, designed and developed by WCCO TV cameramen themselves. This light unit weighs far less than most commercial units, but provides a longer performance life and greater durability. The continuing search for portability led to the development of a new lightweight, easily handled amplifier and power pack for recording sound on film by WCCO TV News. This unit goes wherever a cameraman goes, enabling him to report with sound and a picture on any story. Similar efforts at technological development were directed toward getting top quality film footage on the air fast, faster than the competitor. The result was a high-speed transmission and specially designed temperature controls which will enable this reversal processing equipment to turn out the first 100 feet of film in six minutes and each additional 100 feet in one minute without sacrificing the technical quality of the film product. Because of this high-speed modification, WCCO-TV newsreel cameramen often arrive at the lab with a late-breaking story after a major newscast has gone on the air and are still able to process and edit their film in time to get their story into the final minutes of that newscast. To take full advantage of all sources of newsreel footage, WCCO-TV News has been equipped with a kinescope recording installation and a videotape recorder. These provide newsreel footage of events telecast live locally or fed to the station by the CBS network. WCCO television newsreel cameramen churn through 750,000 feet of 16 millimeter reversal film each year. But each and every assignment must pass the hands of the skilled editors who man this lab, cutting the film with creative precision, a job which can make or break every story before it gets on the air. These editing facilities were specifically designed by WCCO TV News to fit its own needs. Today's news may happen today, or it may concern something which happened yesterday. That's when a reporter turns to the morgue, the library, where millions of feet of newsreel film shot by WCCO TV cameramen in days gone by are carefully cataloged and filed. Each day adds several thousand feet of film, history as it happens, to this library, adding to the pictorial record, which now spans a period of 10 years. Moments of history, preserved for the day when they will lend new insight and understanding to the news. Blending the creative skills of cameraman and writer is a partnership and communication. More than a million words of copy a year adds the breath of life and comprehension to the story, which together word and picture must tell. Newsman Jerry Rosselt holds the Sigma Delta Chi National Award for Excellence in recognition of his skill as a writer. One example of the performance which has become a trademark of electronic journalism for the community WCCO television newsmen serve. It's a deciding factor in evidence when cameramen and reporters undertake each assignment, whether it be on skid roll, doomed to oblivion by city planners, Inside the city council chambers where aldermen and public speakers debate the transfer of a liquor license into a residential neighborhood. Or at a public school where special classes are underway for the community's gifted children whose learning process must suddenly take into account an age of space conquest. Reporters covering their regularly assigned beats anywhere in our two cities and more than a dozen suburban communities maintain a constant and knowing vigil for the news stories which lend themselves to film treatment. Each day they develop stories to supplement the news editor's film budget. And operating procedure is flexible to ensure that these stories can be covered as they materialize. Routine day in day out coverage of news for television is a demanding adventure and ingenuity and imagination for newsmen. It's not nearly as easy to communicate controversial proposals for the location of a new freeway as it is to capture a dramatic moment of human interest. But newsmen attempting to produce a well-rounded diet of news about their community encounter a wide range of subjects which can only be told effectively through the use of such visual aids as animation, 
The press of time and circumstance, as well as the limitation of available facilities, sometimes restricts these efforts to events of key interest and importance in the community. Planning a newscast's on-the-air production long before the deadline helps its editor and production director present alert, organized, and technically adept coverage of the news smoothly in a tightly knit program. The news editor and production director for WCCO Television's 10 o'clock news begin their liaison even before the station's early evening newscast has been completed. To extend the influence of newsmen into the studio control room, Charles Sorlin, formerly senior cameraman on the news staff, has been trained in the specifics of studio production. His experience blends well with the background of the newscast editor, Tom Pettit, a veteran newsreel cameraman, reporter, and newscaster. He draws heavily on that background for a feel of the news and the most effective methods of presenting each story and editing the newscast. Emphasis on experience, professional training, and educational background extends to the other members of the WCCO TV news staff, reporters and cameramen alike, skilled in the arts peculiar to electronic journalism. Not one of them has the mere casual acquaintance with sight and sound reporting, which seemed to be the trademark of many newsmen in television just a few years ago. This because facilities and equipment, no matter how advanced, cannot outperform the men who use them. The day's planning and coverage a reflection of the day's news, usually goes forward without a hitch, each story falling into place in a cohesive presentation. But, news being what it is, the editor can't count on that. His planning and coordination must always be able to take into account the sudden shift in direction he'll need to get a late-breaking story, one which must be covered in minutes rather than hours, without a total disruption of the work already in progress. Three, four, seven. 347, an explosion and fire, possibly a plane crash, Highway 55 and 218. Let us know what help you need. We'll start an ambulance right away. What's your location? I'm in St. Paul near the cathedral. Okay, Highway Patrol has an explosion and fire, possibly a plane crash near Inver Grove. Must be on a farm. From where you are, better take uh, South Concord to Highway 100. I'll let you know what more I can find out in just a few minutes. Tom, you better come in here and take a look at this. What do you got? Well, Highway Patrol has a fire and explosion, possibly a plane crash down in here. I would imagine it's a farm. I've got Kaufman on the way, but I haven't had time to check it out. Any injuries done? I don't know for sure, but they're sending an ambulance. Well, you better check the highway patrol and the sheriff's office, and I'll get Bartlemy on the phone to call around the area. 368. They need help at Inver Grove. That's a plane crash and the whole farm is on fire. Sounds bad. You better tell Bill to shoot what he can and get back for the 10 o'clock. You want to call another man from home, Tom? Well, maybe you better. That'll cover us when Bill leaves the scene, if it's as bad as it sounds. If we can find a survivor or an eyewitness at a hospital, we'll have to send Bartouche from here. Within moments after the first call, the pattern of coverage is set. A reporter is assigned to it, and he'll soon know whether that pattern is adequate to handle the story. He'll assemble all available details to form the framework of the first report at 10 o'clock. Maybe the cameraman can get back with his film, Maybe not. The editor has an odds-even chance of getting his late story in time, so he must push the rest of the newscast preparation as far ahead of schedule as possible to make way for it. The director, the newscaster, time the copy as it's turned in by the writers, checking the scene times against the footage edited in the lab, an exacting task which ensures that narrative and picture work together to tell their story. Deft hands wind through hundreds of feet of film, searching for just the right scene, and they've few moments to spare. There may not be time to change a single scene now that the news editor has decided to try for late film of the plane crash, each man working under pressure to get his job done. The cameraman at the scene radios back that he'll be starting in with his film at any moment. 
Another cameraman, called in to pick up where the first man left off, arrives at the scene to take over, checks the missing angles with the man who's leaving, and then moves on to the crash scene. Two-way radio communication enables the cameraman to brief the writer assigned to the story on the details from the scene, outline the film coverage he has, and suggest an outline of the newsreel story. It's not an ideal situation by any stretch of the imagination, but then news seldom happens under what a newsman would call ideal circumstances. The rehearsal without the plane crash footage. The newscaster won't have an opportunity to see either film or script on that until after he's on the air. But the remainder of the show must go as smoothly as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Here it is, six minutes until airtime, but the film is in the lab. Barring a problem which could not have been foreseen, and that sometimes happened, the plane crash story is a cinch for the last film in the newscast. If all goes well, it might get on sooner. The writer and the cameraman collaborate on final details in the story. While other staff members group around a monitor to watch their newscast on the air. WCCO Television, Channel 4, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Now, the Dave Moore News. Good evening, everyone. Tonight's news is headlined by the crash of an Air Force B-52 jet bomber on the August Call Farm near Inver Grove. A WCCO-TV news cameraman has just returned to our newsroom with that story on film, and we'll have it for you just as soon as the film is processed. Minneapolis City Councilman came to grips with an ageless problem today, a request to transfer a liquor license into what is now a residential neighborhood. Residents of the area, apparently satisfied with the neighborhood the way it is, told License Committee Chairman Frank Walensky and his colleagues they want no commercial intruder in their midst, particularly a liquor establishment. First came the wet and dry issue. We pastors come very, very close to homes that are broken by liquor. And many a wife has told me within the past few days that they are having enough trouble with their husbands now. And if this liquor is introduced this close, they're going to have even a rougher time. After that, the story of liquor and broken homes told by a minister. I come to plead for the homes of the young men and young women who are trying to live a calm, quiet, peaceful community life. I know their struggles. I know their ambitions. I know their attempts to live an honorable life in the community. And I also know the tragedy and the heartache that comes where liquor is too available. And then the other side of the coin, the lone supporter of the proposal at today's hearing. I believe there are some people in this crowd, too, who wouldn't mind taking a snort. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. But anyway, I'm not the kind that's going to be a hypocrite and come in here and talk dry and drink what? The councilmen are equally divided on the transfer at the moment. They've delayed a final decision. Have the three T's replaced the three R's in our schools? An internationally recognized University of Minnesota educator, Dean Athelston Spilhaus, thinks so. He says we'd better get back to the three R's. Well, I think we ought to take a good, hard, self-critical look at our whole educational system, not just worry about Sputnik. Uh, the whole degradation of our educational system which has taken place, uh, what I call the creeping in of soft education, replacing the good old hard education. In other words, replacing what has come into being in our schools and replace the three R's. I think we ought to go back to the three R's and abandon what I call the three T's, the, this emphasis on typewriting, tap dancing, and tomfoolery. Let's get back to studies.
Virtually. Extremely popular in the school, surveyed by reporter John Briska and cameraman Gordon Bartouche, because the students learn a communication skill, which has an immediate, tangible application. Tomfoolery? Well, only if you're too old to remember what it's like to be young. Tap dancing, typewriting, and tomfoolery? Yes, but much more in some schools. Teachers undergoing intensive training in a new program designed to measure the abilities of each school child at an age when differences in potential learning first begin to show up. A mass testing program for older students, which will single out those especially gifted youngsters who can be placed in a new high school curriculum of concentrated mathematics and science. Sixth graders in a special class conducted by a university professor on the level of college freshmen and doing better work than many of the college students he regularly instructs. New high school facilities for science students working under basic research conditions, encouraged to move ahead as rapidly as their own abilities permit, undertaking an unlimited scope of problems and experiments to arrive at their own conclusions. And laboratories, where any experiment poses problems no teacher can solve. Laboratories so old, in such disrepair, that even the water faucets leak. A deserted lecture room where the only problem on the blackboard remains unanswered. Three T's in the Twin City schools, well, perhaps, but also some of the most advanced and some of the most retarded classrooms in the nation. Economists and government officials seem to agree tonight that the recession is receding, but they get no support from the nation's jobless, those who lost their jobs at the height of the economic setback and are still trying to make ends meet on unemployment compensation. Channel 4 newsman Bob Spangler found the claim check line as long today as it was six months ago. Labor Secretary Mitchell has predicted that unemployment will rise for the next month or two due to seasonal factors. Apparently, the season is about right in the Twin Cities. The general area of this employment office is pretty well jammed, as you can see for yourself. But note, some of the longest lines are the new claims lines. Like Mr. Mitchell said, seasonal difficulties enter here. It's getting a little chilly for many construction jobs. And of course, the demand for extra holiday workers has disappeared. What about the people themselves? Yes, they think they'll be going back to work soon. I think you'll, you've got a pretty good chance of getting back on? Well, I should have, but you never know. Well, that's a question, probably a matter of days or a matter of a week or so. When do you expect to be going back to work, sir? Well, that's pretty hard to say. If they hit water, I'll go to work most any time. What are you, a well driller? <laughs> sure, digger. Uh, no matter how many of these people do find work, there'll be quite a few taking their places in the compensation lines. Last year, the recession year, the single office paid over $12.5 million in claims, better than twice the normal. All these people are hoping Labor Secretary Mitchell knows what he's talking about when he predicts that non-farm employment will climb to its highest point in American history before 1959 comes to a close. We hope so, too. St. Paul City planners and businessmen are at odds tonight with the State Highway Department in a controversy which threatens to delay the state's use of federal freeway building funds for months, maybe years. The dispute concerns the location of the link between sections of the freeway connecting south, west, and north freeway trunks, a link vital to the overall freeway plan because without it, cross-state traffic will not be possible and a link vital to the St. Paul city and business interests, because with it, their loop may well be cut off from the state capital. State highway department planners have already started implementing their plans to bring a southern freeway into St. Paul here, the western freeway into the city here, and the northern freeway up the Mississippi and onto Duluth by way of St. Paul's northeastern corner. The question is, where to route the connecting link between these freeway trunks? The highway department wants to put it here, a simple straight shot from northeast to southwest. But St. Paul officials and businessmen say that's a fatal shot as far as they're concerned because it would virtually cut off the city loop from the state capital and its important offices and business potential. They want state highway department planners to revise their proposal and route the connecting link in a belt from south to west to north to east around the city and the state capital. A series of conferences is underway this week aimed at a solution or compromise. 
But the St. Paul interests have hired a professional consultant office to back up their demands for a revision of freeway plans which could divide the city loop from the state capital. Skid Row, target of University of Minnesota sociologists, doomed by urban renewal. The university experts have completed a study which proposes that the city set up another skid row after the bulldozers have smashed this one into dust. Tonight, newsman Tom Pettit begins a series of reports based on that study. Skid Row, sometimes called the Lower Loop. This is the oldest part of the city, and it's home for nearly 3,000 people. They face imminent loss of their home as the city's Lower Loop redevelopment project goes into effect. Ancient buildings are going down to be replaced by shiny new civic buildings and sterile office buildings. A master plan to give the Lower Loop a new face and new value. But there is no such plan for the people who live on Skid Row. Who are these people? They are mostly elderly men in low-income classifications who have found a place to retire. The average age is 60. They are not transients. This is where they live. They are single men, more than 50% never married. Less than 5% now are married. Nearly one-fourth are foreign-born, mostly from Scandinavia and Western Europe. Negroes and Indians make up an almost negligible part of the Skid Row population. Almost no women make their homes on Skid Row. Income here is very low. More than half get less than $80 a month. But you can live cheap on Skid Row. You can eat for $1.60 a day. You can get a bed for $5 a week. You can get by on 70 bucks a month for food and shelter. If you don't mind sleeping in what is called a cage or cubicle, if you don't mind high tuberculosis and high venereal disease rates, if you don't mind an informal prostitution system in your bars, if you're not too particular about your food. You can live cheaper here than anywhere else in the city. And for many pensioners, this is the only place they can afford to live. But all this is going. And what of the people? Tomorrow night, we'll find out why people live on Skid Row. This map pinpoints the location of that B-52 crash, the August Call Farm south of St. Paul near Inver Grove. Details are sketchy, but here's what we know about it, along with first films just processed in our newsroom. The plane was a B-52 jet bomber from the Strategic Air Command, the type of plane normally carrying a nuclear payload. But even though some witnesses described the explosion as like an atomic bomb, Air Force authorities say this plane was not armed. The huge plane tore a 300-foot crater across the August Call Farm when it struck and then exploded. First reports indicated that several bodies were found in the debris, but it's believed that at least one member of that eight-man crew parachuted from the plane. There are no confirmed survivors, however, and no names available from the plane's eastern base. The fire from the crash spread quickly to the Call Farmhouse and other buildings, consuming them and the family car. The eight members of the Call family who had been in the farmhouse escaped with minor injuries, but have been hospitalized for treatment. Standing room only at the new Metropolitan Stadium today for the season's opener, which saw Wichita drop the Millers 4-2. to two. It was a great day for a ball game. Were you there?
The umpires behind the plate, Phillips. At first base, Marcos. At second base, Morrissey. And at third base, Mullen. Now, as a footnote to this story of news as it happens, here is WCCO Television's director of news, sports, and special events, Raleigh Johnson. The story you have just seen was as real as the people who portrayed it. A rare assignment for them to tell their own rather than someone else's story. You may have witnessed more exciting or sensational newsreel footage than the assignments covered in this documentary, but then we planned it that way. You see, we believe that the total endeavor of a news gathering organization, a barometer of daily community and public service, is a more engrossing and meaningful story than any single event its newsmen may have an opportunity to report. We are actively pursuing all the news, and it is fundamental to this effort that the motion picture itself serves no greater master than effectively communicating a record of history as it happens. I have here a study of the motion picture arts. Permit me to read you a transcript of a patent brief filed in 1864 by a Frenchman named Ducat who had invented a device which would reproduce images on a continuous strip of celluloid. He said, and I quote him, I am especially enabled to reproduce the passing of a procession, a review of military maneuvers, the movements of a battle or a public feat. There will be, as it were, a living representation of nature, the news as it happens.